I will be talking on clinical case scenarios. And uh, the tagline that I put there is what the mind does not know, eyes cannot see, uh, implying for myself and also for everybody around us that uh, we need to improve our knowledge and we need to keep seeing our patients because this is an evolutionary science. Uh, I probably would want Lillian's comments at the end. I still think that there's miles to go in this, just like any, any other science, but this is a nascent science. And therefore, observing your patients carefully, observing our patients carefully is one of the chief things that I want to stress on with my presentation. I'll be exemplifying a few lessons that, uh, for myself and as well as for others through eight case examples. And then I will give out a performer that we use at our center so that we are not missing on any signs and symptoms that can tell the entire story. And then we can confirm that with our lab tests, which can then be uh, more targeted rather than being very broad spectrum because cost is a huge issue in our country. So let's look at the case number one. A 45-year-old female underwent a ruined y gastric bypass with us and lost enough weight and had a resolution of diabetes. However, two years, she started complaining that she has weakness and this would not go with uh, the routine advices that we were giving her, including what the dietitian was telling her. Now, this is the first question I want to raise with the entire house who's there with us. Is weakness the com commonest complaint of your bariatric patient? Because it is definitely the commonest complaint from, from my bariatric patients. So our center, we see that the commonest complaint that somebody says is weakness. The differential diagnosis of this weakness uh, is something that we've been working on and we've been thinking uh, after pinpointing to the diagnosis, we have accumulated what were the causes of the weaknesses that uh, patients complain. And we have come out with a mnemonic, which is dampen. And I will not keep it in hiding for too long. This is not a suspense uh, film. So D for dehydration and dumping, A for anemia and autonomic insufficiency, M for micronutrient deficiencies, psychological, protein energy deficiency, and neurological. So the, this is what the mnemonic is there for us. And it is very helpful for us to pinpoint and understand what the cause could be. So if any patient complains to us for uh, weakness, we start thinking about dehydration. We start probing about questions which can tell us what the diagnosis is. So if somebody is not consuming enough fluids throughout the day and somebody shows up some xerosis on the skin and loss of skin turgor, we know it's a dehydration. If on probing questions, we find that the patient, the patient says that I feel particularly weak after a meal, and especially a heavier meal, and it's giddiness and there's some diaphoresis or sweating, we think it is dumping. If somebody complains of weakness as well as saying that, you know, when I walk upstairs, I start feeling, uh, I pant a lot, uh, and there's hair loss, we start thinking of anemia. And if the history is that this weakness comes particularly when I wake up from the bed or I stand up from the sitting position or my supine position, we start thinking about autonomic insufficiency. Micronutrient deficiencies like iron, vitamin D, and others also contribute. And this can also be picked up by careful examination of the patient and probing questions. Psychological aspect is important because at least in our community that what we have seen in the practice, uh, in the society that we practice in, a lot of patients do have um, a bias against bariatric surgery, a lot of people, and they would tell the patient, you know, you're not looking as good as you used to look before. Or they would say, you know what, you're eating so little, I think you're feeling weak. And there is an emotional transference of this weakness to the patient. So probing questions and understanding uh, this phenomena by the psychologist becomes very important to know whether this weakness is entirely psychological in origin or if there's any organic cause. Protein energy deficiency, unlike what I used to imagine years back as somebody with an emaciated marasmic patient or somebody with Koshyarkar, is not exactly uh, what it is. Protein energy deficiency or malnutrition is a spectrum. And when the patient starts beginning to have protein energy malnutrition, 
the initial complaints are of weakness and therefore weakness is something that we must look into and lastly neurological causes or neurological complications after bariatric surgery have become more understood than before and we now know that starting from peripheral neuropathy to myelopathy to various other demyelinating diseases can happen after bariatric surgery and that instability may be misinterpreted by the patient as a neurological problem so um, if we examine this patient this is xerosis so weakness with xerosis my first diagnosis would be dehydration this is a patient weak weak patient pregnant and also shows phrenoderma this means that the patient is having multifactorial problems probably uh, vitamin a e essential fatty acids uh, all these uh, deficiencies are probably existing in this patient this is angular stomatitis and therefore we suspect that a b complex deficiency is responsible for the weakness uh, in this patient and if if we do measure the blood pressure in supine and standing position a uh, hairway showing sitting but ideally standing uh, then we might find a drop in blood systolic blood pressure in one of our patients just about a month back there was a drop of systolic blood pressure of 30 mm of mercury and this patient was complaining of profound weakness and we diagnosed that this could be a case of autonomic insufficiency so very frankly once we know the causes of weakness and we apply our minds then and uh, then we can pinpoint to a particular diagnosis otherwise weakness can mean so many things to so many people and two uh, pinpointing the diagnosis may be like picking up a needle in the haystack so weakness is the first case example that i wanted to discuss over to the second case example i must thank uh, my senior colleague dr parveen bhatia from delhi for giving contributing this uh, pictures of this case this 35 year old male who was hypertensive and super obese had a sleeve and at 3 weeks he came with vomiting and dysphagia now i must bring it to attention that a post bariatric patient having vomiting is bad news and giving ondan septron on the phone and a metoclopramide on the phone is not enough and these are patients that can develop neurological problems if not addressed early so i will repeat that statement because very important for me to be rem to remember as well as i would like to share it with everyone emesis nausea and vomiting in the early post operative period is bad news because it is the harbinger for neurological complications after bariatric surgery so it's very important to remember this so this patient particularly complained of weakness dribbling of saliva from the angle of the mouth confusion and having double vision and if you look carefully at the patient's eyes you find that the eyeballs have are not looking in the straight line there is ophthalmoplegia and if you look at this video you find that this patient is not having a normal gait there is an ataxia and therefore this diagnosis in this patient would be well is this a stroke is this a stenosis and causing uh, a dysphagia and thiamine deficiency so we need to know which one this is or maybe it's a combination mri brain was normal remember even on a 35 year old brain um, a male patient this can happen we have we know of patients who have had stroke in the early post operative period the gastroscopy was normal excluded incisural stenosis or reflux which can cause dysphagia and there was low vitamin b1 therefore clinching the diagnosis of wernicke wernicke's encephalopathy as described by lillian in the earlier uh, uh, in the earlier talk and there is plenty of uh, published literature on wernicke's encephalopathy what i would like to highlight here that we uh, the patient these patients have to be put on to a very high dosage of intravenous thiamine to the tune of 100 to 300 mg per day and we should not be bothered or we should not be uh, skeptical about using such high doses because frankly it's a water soluble vitamin and there is no known toxic side effect therefore putting an intravenous high dose is important and even a discharge this patient should be put on a very high dose like 600 mg of thiamine tablets per day oral tablets and the reason is that if we are not correcting them adequately they may be residual and irreversible 
neurological damage. So that is something that we cannot afford to have. And therefore, these high dosages are absolutely justified. Before we proceed to the next case, I would like to draw attention to some theory regarding the neurological complications after bariatric surgery. I will insist people who are interested to read this paper by Anna Lande. And this paper tells us that the causes of neuropathy are mechanical, which is like neuropraxia. Immediately after the surgery, the hands have been probably not kept properly or the legs, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve has got compressed and can lead to myralgia parasitica, a condition where the lateral side of the thigh has either a tingling sensation or current-like sensation. There could be inflammatory or immunological causes of neuropathies. Uh, and uh, uh, there have been studies where nerve biopsies have picked up these uh, uh, complexes, immunological complexes, and even inflammatory infiltrates. But frankly, most people believe that these neuropathies are nutritional in origin. And therefore, uh, having a good regimen, especially in the early, the first year of the surgery, it's very important to ensure that there is no vomiting and the patient is compliant to the bariatric supplements if we want to prevent this very dangerous complication. And among the nutritional causes of neuropathies, we would like to remember that B1, B12, folic, folic acid, copper, vitamin D and vitamin E are important in neuro vitamins and minerals that are responsible for neuropathies and we will touch them again later proceeding to the case three an ileal transposition was done in a gentleman who in the third year started complaining of syncopal attacks and palpitation now when there is syncopal attack somebody falls down suddenly with palpitation obviously we would like to consider certain diagnosis such as the cardiac problem this patient also on probing said, yes, we have stopped using supplements in the last six months. So the differential diagnosis in this case was a dumping syndrome, cardiac problem, or a neuropathy. So uh, I would like to at least stimulate this thought in the mind that with a syncopal attack, we must think not only about the cardiac issue, but also of dumping. Dumping can lead to a, a fall, a sudden fall. A neuropathy can lead to a fall. So syncopal attack, these are your differential diagnosis. What we did was when we examined this patient thoroughly, we found that there was blackish pigmentation in the temples and also some other parts of the body. Now, this is not a canforsis nigricans, which is, which is basically an uh, insulin resistance stigmata. When it is all over the body, it may be a representative of B-complex deficiency. Also, we found, as you can see here, an absent tendon jerk. So no knee jerk here. And of course, with these two findings in our mind, we did think, OK, this is a neuropathy probably. The dermatological finding is confirming a nutritional problem. A knee jerk, absent knee jerk is confirming a neurological problem. So probably we're dealing with a nutritional neurological problem. But we still need to exclude what we thought about. So we did MRI brain and spine, nerve conduction studies, Holter ECG and echocardiography, and blood tests for looking at neuro vitamins and minerals, as you can see here. And these tests, what did they tell us? That there was a low vitamin B1. And there was also sensory motor neuropathy picked up on nerve conduction tests. So it's a peripheral neuropathy that this patient was having. What did we do? Generally, uh, this may come from our own personal experience. We like to admit these patients for a few days. We put them on bariatric supplements, oral, as well as intravenous. We know that this patient was not compliant, and we don't want to risk sending them back home. So a good practical suggestion is do admit, do put them on bariatric with supplements, and in these patients, we put them on a high dose of thiamine uh, intravenous injection. We also give them vitamin B12 shots, folate, copper, vitamin E. As a broad spectrum empirical therapy, even before the test results are available. In fact, uh, about 10 years, uh, about seven, eight years back, we didn't even have the means of measuring so many things. Not that we do. And in that, uh, in that situation, also based on the published literature, we used to do this. And we have found that this nutritional strategy helps. So in any of these nutritional neuropathic patients, 
uh, this is what I'm saying, and I want to repeat this because it's it's an important point that I'm claiming to make, is that we give broad spectrum empirical neurovitamins and minerals in these patients. We add physiotherapy to this patient, and they generally show improvement. And in fact, uh, we've just had one, uh, one patient who had a residual neuro deficit, and we will discuss that case. So case four, and let's move out from neuropathy. And this is what we have. A 38-year-old female with super obesity underwent a Ruan Y gastric bypass with us. At one year, she came back with an exertional breathlessness. When we did the hemoglobin study, it was 8.9. Now, what is the further management of this patient? According to ASMBS guidelines, we would do iron ferritin, B12, folate, albumin as the first line test, and that's what we did. But I would like to bring up this particular, uh, uh, highlight this point, not that it has not been mentioned in the guidelines, but I would like to highlight this, again, not only for sharing with everybody, but as a reminder to myself that how much this has helped us in our own practice. When we look at anemia in our patients, we always look at the peripheral smear, and we want to see if it is a microcytic, normocytic, megaloblastic, or mixed peripheral smears. Microcytic, megaloblastic, mixed or normocytic smear. I, I, I tend to repeat, please bear with me, because again, this is more like a reminder to myself. And in this patient, it was a microcytic anemia, low iron and low ferritin, normal B12 and folate, and we made a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. But let's go back again here. Let's say that you did get a, a microcytic anemia, uh, you got a, a megaloblastic anemia on your peripheral smear, but low iron, normal vitamin B12. How would you corroborate? It won't corroborate, right? You would expect to see microcytic anemia in this patient. Now, if you see any mixed result, it is good to go back to the basic and see a little more, uh, probe a little more, do second line tests. Because what we may find is some patients may have some other problems, like for, for instance, uh, somebody showing up a megaloblastic picture, maybe consuming alcohol. And maybe that is why this patient is having a megaloblastic picture. And although the iron is low and the other things uh, may not be coming up, like for example, B12 is not enough, you may have to do homocysteine levels and uh, 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 MMA levels to be sure that you're not missing on a B12 deficiency. So in this patient, we did confirm an iron deficiency anemia. We gave this patient intravenous iron in our center. Now we are concentrating more on putting patients on intravenous iron because of simplicity and, and there is a rising, there is some intolerance to oral iron and many patients discontinue them. So we resort to intravenous iron. The important thing to see from here is that we still add an extra B12 and folate to these patients because when you add iron to anemic patients, they still would require an extra B12 and folate for hematopoiesis. The important thing that again we must put here as surgeons, I know we are very much tuned to understanding that you cannot keep on adding iron to a leaking bucket, which basically means that if somebody's got a, a menorrhagia, an abnormal uterine bleeding, or piles, bleeding piles, then these patients, but these pa uh, the but these patients need to be ruled out for for uh, for bleeding source. If they are bleeding, then they will probably not have they will not have a, a response to the uh, or iron supplementation. But what if all these tests are normal? Then the question of second line tests come, and the second line tests uh, are copper, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin E levels. This is, uh, they, they will typically have microcytic pictures most of the time. And sometimes you will get anemia with normocytic pictures. And these are patients who will be unsuspected uh, chronic liver disease or chronic kidney disease. So it's a, it's a very great tool, this peripheral smear. If you see a normocytic picture and there is a persistent anemia in this patient, suspect that we may be missing on a cirrhotic patient or may be missing on a chronic kidney disease patient. So this is the full uh, algorithm of how we manage and how we see these patients. And uh, 
this basically is exactly what I have been talking about in evaluation of anemia. Let's go to case number five. A 60-year-old male patient who had a one anastomosis gastric bypass, also called the mini gastric bypass, two and a half years back. Remember, this is a diversionary procedure, a malabsorptive procedure. So this patient came at the end of one year and was seen by the nutritionist who said, well, you've lost 70 kilos. That's great. What is not great is that this is not a great picture. If you only look at the weight loss of a patient, and the patient has lost 100% excess body weight uh, loss, then uh, this is not a great sign of progress. Possibly this patient is heading towards protein energy malnutrition and one should not be happy, but just knowing uh, that, oh, this patient has done brilliantly, this lost 70 kilos. I would like to uh, show you what happens to this patient at two and a half years. The patient was lost to follow up for 18 months in between for circumstances, very extraordinary circumstances. Uh, so this patient came back with weakness on a wheelchair, unable to walk, oily stools, leg edema, severe pallor, and obviously with more than 100% excess body weight loss. And what you see is a zephoid protruding out of the abdomen because of severe, severe fat loss. Now, what is the lesson that we're learning from this case? A is, let me introduce the concept of sarcopenia already introduced by Lillian. When we see weight loss, a weight loss is a function of both muscle loss and fat loss. So when there is fat loss, a muscle, a weight loss, there is some fat loss and some muscle loss too. If we talk about dieting induced weight loss, there will be 30% muscle loss and 70% fat loss. And when we talk about bariatric surgery induced uh, weight loss, we probably will be seeing about 15% muscle loss and about 85% uh, uh, fat loss. But if we have more muscle loss and less proportion of fat loss, we are heading towards a condition called sarcopenia. And if we don't catch on to sarcopenia early, then we will be heading, this patient will be heading towards a protein energy malnutrition. It's a very dangerous condition. I'd just like to bring attention to a very practical example. Look at this. Weight, uh, this is a body composition analysis in three months of a patient. The patient started with 1,453 kilo at the time of surgery and dropped to 135 kilos in three months, right? That is about 18 kilos of weight loss. And what is the muscle loss here from 41.8 to 35? So seven kilos of muscle loss. Now, bit from 18 kilos, if seven kilos is the muscle loss, this is not a good weight loss. This is a bad weight loss. We just need about 15 to 20 percent muscle loss, which would have been in this patient about um, at the max three and a half to four kilos. So if somebody's lost seven kilos, it's, it's time to realize this is not a happy thing. So I want to bring to your notice that as a nutritionist, as a surgeon, when you see a patient's post-op, don't see only of weight loss. See how much proportion of this weight loss is fat loss and how much proportion is muscle loss. In this patient, how was the treatment done? We admitted the patient. Now Again, I'll come back to the same point. When you see this kind of patient, they cannot be managed domiciliarily. You have to admit this patient. So we admitted this patient. The tests were done which gave an abysmal level of albumin like 1.8. Hemoglobin was 8.5. That was despite hemoconcentration. Vitamin D was 7.5. Iron was uh, abysmally low, 8 nanograms per ml. So when we treat these patients, there are certain things that I want to highlight. These patients are not only malnourished, they are dehydrated. They have dyselectrolytemia. So we have to put them on intravenous fluids. We have to give them glucose, but as soon as you talk about giving glucose to these patients, remember we have to add thiamine to this patient from reason mentioned by Lillian earlier. You need thiamine to metabolize the glucose in this patient. Also, these patients are very low on phosphorus and magnesium. And if you give them glucose only without phosphorus and magnesium, you may have something called refeeding syndrome, a dangerous condition. So we have to give them, supplement them with phosphorus and magnesium as well of course blood needs to be transfused iron needs to be given 
parenteral nutrition needs to be added with the enteral nutrition and in most circumstances these are patients are not tolerating enteral nutrition due to uh, small intestinal and bacterial overgrowth and multivitamin infusions need to be given if the patient can tolerate oral bariatric vitamin multivitamins need to be given as well b12 shots are also given zinc and copper are also given in these patients so it's a huge huge ordeal and it takes weeks for these patients to get better and at certain point of time surgeons will have to think about either reversing this patient but more often than not we will have to be content with putting in a g tube a tube inside the remnant uh, uh, stomach so that we can feed from there and replace the patient's nutrition till the patient becomes to, uh, comes to a condition suitable for general anesthesia suitable for reversal and sometimes they can do well only with the tube gastrostomy remember that we have done this study in uh, in our own country and we reported this and plenty of centers came in together to publish this epsor study where we showed that the gastric bypass patient and the sleeve gastric bypass patient the mean level of albumin goes down but then stabilizes but in one anastomosis gastric bypass the mean levels of albumin keeps falling even at the end of 5 years which basically says tells us that some patients of an anastomosis gastric bypass are dropping their protein levels or albumin serum albumin levels even at 5 years and therefore there uh, this own means that surveillance has to be more vigilant and the uh, uh, the testing has to be annually in these cases let's go to case number 6 A 45-year-old female Rouen Y gastric bypass at fourth year comes for an annual checkup and complains of a low back pain, which has been happening for the last six months. She was going to an orthopedician, and she had complained that this is going to the legs. The orthopedician did note that this patient has undergone a bariatric surgery and thought that this is basically because of calcium and uh, vitamin D deficiency. And she was supplemented with those, although she was consuming sub bariatric supplements. He had he added some extra supplements of calcium and vitamin D and some analgesics. She did not respond totally. Then she stopped her supplements, uh, and then when she reported to us with this back pain, which was not going, we did this following lab test, which is according to the ASMBS guidelines: the urinary calcium, alkaline phosphatase, vitamin D, serum parathormone, bone scan. and an x-ray spine before we took the patient for an mri lumbosacral spine now i must confess we don't need to do all of this but when some patients come complaining with the back pain excruciating excruciating back pain especially perimenopausal women we tend to do more of these uh please note we have not mentioned serum calcium because serum calcium is a very poor indicator of the total calcium in these patients the x-ray of this patient showed this and i must thank my colleague who got this picture uh so this is a compression fracture of the lumbar vertebra the l1 what l to l1 vertebra probably and you can see that there is a compression when you come compare with others and therefore there is a compression of the nerve roots and that is causing the pain which is radiating to the thigh and these patients would require Uh, uh bed rest and sometimes they will require some some sort of orthopedic uh interventions as well remember the fractures in bariatric surgery has a higher risk than normal population has been shown and secondary hyperparathyroidism which basically is responsible for bone loss is seen as early as 1 year even in sleeve gastrectomy to, to the tune of 20% and in malabsorptive procedures to the tune of 50% so we must be aware of this bone loss that happens in these patients the strategy should be to use calcium uh, citrate uh, as prophylaxis and uh, as well as in treatment in divided doses and i've mentioned this here because i think it's very important not to give all the calcium in one time the bowels cannot absorb so much of calcium all at once so you may have to divide this into three divided doses if if it is uh, necessary and a high vitamin d uh, uh, dosage like earlier it was lower but now if you see the asmbs guidelines every time the guidelines keep on saying that you need to give more and more of vitamin d just like the 
recommendation for thiamine has gone from two milligrams to more than 12 milligrams. So we are re realizing that we need to give more of these, more dosages of these vitamins. Exercise is a very important strategy to improve bone strength, and that has to be emphasized. And bone scans need to come in early for diversionary and malabsorptive procedures to pick up that they are not going to land up with a fracture. And I've scratched away the bisphosphonates uh, as a treatment for bone loss because A, they cause ulcers, and two, they are not absorbed as well uh, because of low gastric acidity in bariatric patients. So they are not of much help in these patients. So it's important because uh, many of our orthopedic colleagues also need to be told that this is not going to work. Let's look at the case seven. A 24-year-old female underwent a sleeve gastrectomy, and at six months, she came back with hair loss. And that's a very common complaint, and I'm sure each one of you have seen that. Uh, this alopecia is tello, uh, telogious effluum, uh, very difficult to pronounce for me. But what we need to do is reassure them because it's just six months, make sure that they are compliant. But what needs to be known is that these patients come back at 18 months and still complain of the hair loss in the scalp and which has not come back. It's time to check for the compliance seriously and to do some tests. And this would be in our center albumin, iron, ferritin, zinc, folate, and essential fatty acids, which will be in the form of triene tetraene ratio. Uh, please do note I did not mention biotin because there has been some question about whether biotin is really a great uh, uh, a vitamin responsible for hair loss, although it is commercially very popular. What is available, though, is uh, the evidence that if the iron and zinc are two minerals which are uh, heavily responsible for hair loss, so sup if you did want to supplement the patients with some added vitamins apart from the bariatric vitamins if the patient is already taking them, it would be zinc and iron, and uh, those should work in correcting the alopecia. Uh, in, our, in our patients, we have also seen in our cohort that Proteins are something that we are worried about. Uh, very rarely a patient reach a uh, target of 60 grams per day, and that may be responsible for the alopecia. So uh, many of our patients, even at the end of one year, are not achieving a target of 60 grams per day. And there are literature now available to show that indeed uh, 80 to 90 percent of bariatric patients do not achieve that kind of recommended dosage. Let's come to the final case uh, that I want to share with you this evening. Uh, so this 35-year-old female with a, a BMI of 52 and diabetes underwent a bariatric workup. And uh, she, on the bariatric workup, preoperative workup, she had a low vitamin B12, something to the tune of 140. And uh, uh, this was uh, not corrected. And the patient was taken on one anastomosis gastric bypass. And I must say that this practice ha was there with me as well some time back till we realize that this is not a great practice. We need to correct the uh, deficiencies before we take these patients for operation. But medical tourism being one of the uh, important ways of how we get these bariatric patients, there's a lot of pressure in taking these patients as when they come in. And sometimes they're taken up uh, even with deficiencies. I'm not defending it. I'm just admitting uh, or confessing something that we've been doing and it's not right to do. This patient in the early post-operative period had vomiting, which did not, uh, which was protracted, did not respond completely to antiemetics. And I had said earlier, as I had said earlier, vomiting is bad news if it happens in early post-op period. It's a harbinger of neuropathies. It's harbinger for dehydration and for many things to come. Now, this patient uh, was again a medical tourism patient, so had an operation at Center A and then uh, went to another city and did not consume bariatric vitamin. Instead, she was consuming an over-the-counter vitamin mineral tablet. This is what happened to her at six months. I'm not going to tell you about what happened in between. She went to a neurologist because of weakness, who put her on steroids, who evaluated her. Because she was not close to the bariatric center, and she was only uh, on, in touch because on, on telephones, Naturally, she was not getting a proper advice that a bariatric center would have given. So the, the, she was put on steroids. She was, still didn't do well. And she presented to our center at six months in the wheelchair. 
Now, when we evaluated this patient, we found on the nerve conduction study, she had a sensory motor neuropathy, signifying both peripheral neuropathy and myelopathy. MRI of the brain and spine showed demyelination at spinal cord and ischemic changes in temporal lobe. And she had low vitamin B1, B6, and B12. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in all neuropathies, our treatment is been, it has been our bias to use empirical, broad spectrum nutrition supplementation. So we've used, in this patient, we admitted the patient, we gave her uh, oral or bariatric vitamins because she could tolerate. We also added intravenous B1, B12, parenterally, and uh, vitamin E, folate. Uh, and with this, we kept her inside the hospital. We asked the neurologist who said, well, the steroids have been fired. We does, he doesn't see any uh, importance, but we still use some steroids in this patient. We added some psychotherapy, but because this patient was very demoralized, and we added physiotherapy to this patient. Before I tell you what happened to this patient, let me just go back and talk about the learning points from this patient. A, we have realized that if somebody has got a low vitamin in the preoperative period, it is best to correct them before the bariatric procedure. This is not standard practice in many centers, uh, and in fact, in our center also some time back. But this is something that has come up in literature that with pre-op deficiencies, do not tend to get corrected if you try to supplement them post-operatively. This is, it poses a big challenge. So maybe it's a good idea to get nutritional clearance before surgery. I'm probably reiterating was already there, but getting the clearance by the nutritionist before we take any patient for bariatric surgery is important. They say, yes, everything is supplemented. This patient is fine, good to go. And then we take them. And number two, it's important to emphasize to these patients, even if they are not in the same city, that they will need to take not an over-the-counter or gummy multivitamins, as Lillian put it, but a bariatric formulary multivitamin, multimineral for life. And if we keep on emphasizing this before the surgery, it will probably make a difference. I would like to draw your attention to this particular table. Don't look at it. I, you may get phased. I'll, I'll make it easier for you. But this is a comparison between bariatric formulations and non-bariatric formulations. For those of you in India, can recognize the three common popular uh, over-the-counter vitamins. And I'll just compare. Look at vitamin D3 in the two of them. In the conventional over-the-counter, it's zero. And in the bariatric formulation, it's 500. Look at vitamin B1. It's 0.8 in the non-bariatric formulation. It's three milligram in the bariatric formulation. I mean, you get four of those, that's 12 milligrams. It's 60 milligram of folate in the non-bariatric formulation. It's 400 in the bariatric formulation. If you look at B12, it's one in the non-bariatric formulation. It's 500 in the bariatric formulation. So what I am trying to tell you is that over-the-counter formulations are absolutely no-no in these patients, even they have to pay extra, they have to, there is no way out. They have to be counseled that this is what they have to do. And the reason is something that we all know. When we do bypasses, or even if you do sleep, the proximal portion of the GI tract, which contain the active transporters are lost. And therefore these multivitamins, these vitamins and minerals are absorbed entirely by passive diffusion. And therefore higher concentrations need to be given so that the normal serum concentrations of these vitamins and minerals can be available. So that has to be understood. And why lifelong? Well, if you look at our own study here, you can see that the anemia accrues over time, especially with bypasses, but also with sleep. So with time, it's not that these hemoglobin is stabilizing. Hemoglobin levels may keep on falling in some patients even at the end of five years. So that is why lifelong. Look at the albumin levels. Maybe in sleeve and conventional bypass, the mean levels are stabilizing, but not in the outliers. Some patients will show fall. But the mean level of the albumin is falling even at the end of five years, which means what? We need to put them under surveillance lifelong. And if you look, if you are one of those people who think the sleeve gastrectomy do not show up uh, uh, deficiencies after the first two years, well, look at this paper. At the end of four years, 
20% anemia, 15% B12 deficiency, and 60% hyperparathyroidism. So that should at least put us on the back foot even with sleep gastrectomy. Lifelong surveillance. Coming back to end our story about case A, the final case. What happened to the patient? This is how she was at three days after admission. Uh, so you can see that she is walking with support and she can barely take, you know, inches. She can barely walk inches. Look at her at three weeks. We kept her in the hospital for three weeks. And look at her walk. She can now take one, literally one foot or two feet at one time. And she can do this without support. And look at her at three months. So you can see what she is able to do now. So that is not the case for many unfortunate patients. So probably what is good to remember is that we need to prevent these complications. We need to be sensitized. If the mind knows, the eyes will see where the problems lie and we will be able to circumvent this problem rather than treating them. Clinical evaluation, our performa, this is the last segment of what I want to share with you. I had promised that I will share, and this is what I want to share with you. How do we evaluate our patients? Well, before I do that, one message. All the nutritionists and all the surgeons know this table. Okay, this is the vitamin thiamine, and it causes neuropsychiatric symptoms, cardiac problems, GI issues. Vitamin B2 causes anemia, dermatitis, tumultitis, glossitis. And this goes on. We keep on remembering them in this order. I want to tell you, this probably is not the best way of learning. And, and, and those nutritionists who have studied with us, have got trained with us, know that this is not the way we, we, ta we teach. I think this is the way we need to go. We need to know if somebody says loss of taste, we should know what vitamins can cause loss of taste. We should, it should come to a mind that biotin deficiency causes loss of taste. If somebody says constipation, we should know that calcium, vitamin D, and thiamine deficiency causes constipation. If somebody says orthostatic hypotension, apart from autonomic insufficiency, it should strike us that pantothenic acid deficiency can cause orthostatic deficiency. Similarly for leg swelling and selenium. So what I'm saying here is let's just reverse it. First learn the symptom and then assign the deficiency, the nutritional deficiency to it. With that, let me tell you what we do. The history, we recommend that you have a written performer. Do not do it on the basis of memory because we will miss. Do it with a written performer. This is our written performer, a very basic one, a very basic performer which anybody can use. But look at the common complaints that we will not miss. We will not miss vomiting, we will not miss alopecia, we will not miss weakness, we will not miss heartburn, oily stool, bloating. So all of that is kept there. And we also do some barrow scores. We also want to look at exa an examination right from head to toe and look at the area where we have written blood pressure. We want, we want to see the supine and erect blood pressure. We don't want to miss it. Look at the neurological section. We have written there, tendon jerk, sensation, vibration, position sense, motor power, because we don't want to miss it. I will just show you a video of how we do it. Pallor, icterus, ophthalmoplegia, Alopecia, any skin lesion of the scalp that can represent B12, glossitis, anglostomatitis, lymph nodes, any hernia, any port side hernia, any hepatosplenomegaly, any tenderness, any distension just signifying internal hernia or something else, nails, colonychia, poikilonychia, hyperkeratosis, any xerosis, phrenoderma, back of the elbows. What about the sensation? Is the sensation okay bilaterally? Okay. So skin's uh, sensation at the leg area. And then what we do is the plantar reflex. Is the Babinski okay? And now we're looking for knee jerks. Is it hyperreflexia, hyperreflexia? And you want to really, really be sure about these things. Sometimes it's not an accurate test, I must say. But what I'm trying to say is keep the, these instruments in your clinic because this is how you would uh, do it. Now, this is the patient I've already showed you, an absent hyperreflexia in your clinic, and you can pick up a neuropathy. Keeping a blood pressure, 
machine and measuring both supine and erect is very important. Do not only check the body weight, please check the body composition. Check fat mass and fat free mass. And remember, if it is more than if the uh, if the skeletal muscle mass, the muscle mass loss is more than 20 percent of the total loss, then it rings a bell. Are we heading towards a malnutrition? Are we heading towards sarcopenia? And it's the first year which is important. It's the first year where we have to be sure that we are not missing uh, a, a patient progressing into PEM or sarcopenia. And the head to toe examination can pick up so many things. Look at the iron stain in this lady. We, we stopped the oral iron here. Look at the angulostomatitis. Look at the alopecia that we picked up. Look at the skin pigmentation because of B complex deficiency. Look at this patient who became covered with black, uh, just blackish pigmentation throughout the back and the front of the chest. And this turned out to be a B complex deficiency in her. This was a psoriasis which flared up after bariatric surgery. It did not diminish, which is classical switching. It flared up after bariatric surgery. This is phrenoderma, which is multifactorial nutritional problem. And this was a pregnant lady, and therefore you have to be very careful in these patients that we may not, we do not miss these lesions which are talking out to you. This is xerosis, where the patients can actually scratch the nails on the on their surfaces and it will show up. And this is because of very poor water intake. And this is lipodermatosclerosis pre present in the patient prior to the surgery and which did not subside post-operatively. And this is a very interesting case and I'll leave you with this. You can see that this patient came a year and a half after her gastric bypass and look at what is happening. There's a nystagmus. She complained of vertigo and we saw that she also had nystagmus. Now, you can, you can make a diagnosis of benign positional vertigo, but you must remember in a background of bariatric patient, we must also think of the neurovitamins that can contribute to uh, nystagmus. And in this patient, we supplemented her with neurovitamins empirically, broad spectrum, and she did well. My take home message for all of you is malnutrition is the Achilles heel of bariatric surgery. Lifelong surveillance and supplementation is recommended. And nutrition is definitely the center point of managing these bariatric patients. A proforma is probably the best way to uh, go about it and not to miss things. But what you are not going to miss is something that you already need to know. So being vigilant on the patient, seeing the patient carefully, hearing the patient out carefully uh, is very important. So to listen to the patient carefully, he's telling he or she is telling you the diagnosis is one aphorism to remember. And the other aphorism to remember is what the mind does not know, the eyes cannot see. Thank you very much. I hope I have not overshot my time. And if I have, I, I plead guilty and apologize.